Hello, you're watching the Ideas Factory. I'm Nagma. In new developments around the world, NATO has welcomed Finland in its fold, and that changes a lot of things. European Union leaders have rushed to China to seek mediation in Ukraine, despite America playing the leadership role there. That's very significant. And China has increased its aggression in Taiwan and is practicing ceding of, of Taiwan because the Taiwanese president visited America, uh, America and China is showing its anger in practicing the ceding off. So what changes there with this? And of course, we will also look at uh, the, the Chinese aggression in Bhutan, China building up pressure there, and also China riling up India here in Arunachal by name change that we've seen in the recent uh, past. Welcome to you. Harsh, there are a few things that we are going to look at on this episode of the Ideas Factory. A lot, of course, has happened, but let's begin by looking at what has happened here in NATO. Of course, the German Chancellor calls it brain dead, but NATO has welcomed Finland in its fold. What does that change and what does it mean for Russia? Because Russia has now really come at the doorstep. The buffer zone that was there has changed on April 4. All the Nordic countries which acted as the buffer zone. So, uh, what will be the strategic significance of this move? Well, it, you know, this is this is uh, hugely significant in so far as uh, the broader uh, global equations are concerned, and the fact that an organization that post nineteen nineties was seen as mostly a defunct organization, uh, an alliance that was widely in search of a meaning post Cold War, has suddenly found new meaning and and suddenly found new relevance. And if Mr. Putin started off the Ukraine war by saying that, look, uh, NATO has come to my those steps, and that was one of the reasons he gave for unleashing um, his fury against uh, Ukraine. Uh, today, you find countries like Finland and Sweden uh, trying to join NATO, and Finland in this case has formally joined NATO now. So there is a remarkable turnaround in terms of how many of these countries have traditionally looked at their neutral uh, stance uh, in, in European affairs, have tried to maintain relative equidistance from NATO uh, and Russia. Uh, and now, of course, uh, they are making they are making it frontally evident that they see Russia as a major threat. Uh, we have seen Eastern Europeans, Baltic states uh, already uh, in the fold of NATO and have been making a very, very uh, making their presence felt in the in the context of Ukraine war itself. So by and large, we are seeing a, a, a Europe that is trying to come to terms with this uh, revisionism that from their point of view that they see in Russia. And Russia, therefore, will have to respond to this uh, in its own ways. And Russians, for example, were very furious uh, when uh, at, at uh, Finland's accession. Uh, then they said that they were going to put uh, you know, nuclear weapons in Belarus, uh, which has also provoked uh, a set of reactions. So what we are looking at, I think the European security lands landscape in, in extreme flux and not really trying finding the, the equilibrium that perhaps is needed before any kind of a long-term stability can come to a continent. So I think many in Europe would be very worried that a continent, that a, that a region where they felt that perhaps peace had arrived post-Second World War is now back to square one, is now facing a moment of reckoning, is now uh, faces a situation where uh, countries like Germany are, uh, are you know, building up their military muscle. So it's quite an extraordinary moment in that sense uh, for Europe. And of course, it will have implications for Russia, it will have implications for China, and it will have implications for India, how India thinks about its own global uh, policies, its own foreign policy and national security architecture. You spoke of China, you spoke of Europe. Europe is really uh, worried now with uh, what is going on in uh, Ukraine, though, even though America has taken the leadership role there. We've seen that European Union leaders have uh, you know, pushed China to, to bring Russia to its senses, as they called it, and also stop invasion of Ukraine. Europe is now counting on China. Um, you know, in spite of America beckoning. But uh, uh, what happens here? Moscow, uh, Macron also warned of uh, warned the countries that they should not be really shunning China or, uh, you know, resist reducing, they should resist reducing trade from China. So we see that the European Union is looking up to China as its savior and, uh, and a country that is probably going to help them against Ukraine rather than America. What does it tell us about China and its growing significance on global politics? 
you know, I think it tells us more about uh, the fractures within the European Union uh, than it tells us anything about China, because China certainly is now at a stage where uh, it's very difficult to dismiss it, uh, you know, um, uh, whether it is in global governance or, or whether it, it is in framing your strategic response. And we have also seen China coming very close to Russia. Uh, Chinese president's visit to, to Russia uh, was very significant. His first foray after getting in, elected to an unprecedented third term. Uh, he, you know, he, there was a red carpet welcome for him in Russia. Uh, for, in Russia. And it was very clear uh, who was calling the shots, uh, in, in, uh, you know, who is calling the shots in this relationship that has become a relationship uh, between two unequals, uh, you know, between a, uh, and who is the junior partner is fairly evident in, in, in Sino-Russian relationship at the moment. Now, I think what the Europeans uh, are, are showcasing and has been uh, have been showcasing for the last few days and weeks uh, is that the continental Europe is increasingly uncomfortable uh, with the continuation of war in Ukraine, with this uh, coming together of China and Russia in ways that are quite unprecedented, uh, and in the way perhaps they feel that uh, Eastern Europe that has uh, pushed uh, EU into taking a much more forceful stand uh, in vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine than perhaps many in uh, in continental Europe would like. I think those divisions are coming out into the open. And when you see uh, Emmanuel Macron making this outreach, when you see even EU's president, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, making this uh, outreach to to China, you see a continent that is trying to come to terms uh, with the changing global order. In in, in you know in in some ways. China continues to remain the largest trading partner, the biggest economic player on the block. And, and I think uh, uh, the, 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 the European nations, continental Europe, in particular Western Europe, uh, are worried about uh, where the, their economic future is going if this war continues. And I think that's why they, uh, their last hope, they are betting on China to perhaps see uh, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the end game and to perhaps bring some kind of a resolution to this crisis. Now, it's very unlikely that Chinese are going to follow European entreaties to, uh, you know, to bring this war to any kind of a closure. But I think for, for many in Europe, this is perhaps the last option uh, because uh, they do not see uh, Ukraine on its own giving up the fight and they do not see any appetite in uh, Mr. Putin. Uh, to come to a political settlement. And America, of course, has its own agenda vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, vis-a-vis -vis what is happening in Ukraine. So I think there is a, there is a bit of a transatlantic divide that is emerging, but more importantly, uh, intra-European divide that is emerging in how do you counter uh, this the consequences of Russian aggression in Ukraine? What is the political end game here? And how do you ensure that your relationship with China remains preserved, uh, especially the economic one at a time when there is a significant economic crisis uh, brewing in, in, in Europe. And I think those are the those are all the factors that, that brought uh, or that are bringing Europeans to the Chinese shores at the moment. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's very difficult to foresee uh, how the Chinese are going to rise up to the challenge, but they, I think Chinese will be relishing uh, their role uh, as they see that there is possibility of a divide between America and its Atlantic partners, and perhaps that's a wedge that they can exploit to their advantage. So there's clearly disenchantment as far as America is concerned, Europe is concerned. Europe uh, is looking up to China and probably sees that China would be the only country that could uh, bring this I mean, if it ends, if this war ends. Um, also, uh, you know, it, th there is also the fear that they should not be upsetting China. So the trade with China should not suffer. Nobody wants to displease China. So clearly the division in Europe comes out, but also uh, China. China's uh, strategic significance, China's global importance, that is also there. And China's aggression has increased in other areas. We've seen recently how China is conducting, staging live drills for sealing of Taiwan and practicing this sealing off, responding to the Taiwanese president's uh, U.S. visit. And it's uh, calling this exercise joint sword. And uh, by force also, it is very ready to, uh, to kind of take on Taiwan. Uh, U.S. has asked for restraint, but looking at China's significance, uh, it is really unlikely that China will pay heed to any such plea of restraint. 
Uh, yeah, it's very unlikely that uh, that they're going to go back on uh, what they see as a very important uh, security objective, political objective for them, which is reunification of, of Taiwan. And I think Taiwan, therefore, any defiance by Taiwan, any defiance by Taiwanese leadership uh, that uh, does not merit uh, uh, you know, China's approval, uh, will uh, China wants to demonstrate that it will have consequences. And in this case, they have repeatedly done it last year when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. And this year when uh, the Taiwanese president uh, was in, um, uh, you know, it was in the U.S. and, and she met uh, uh, the, the U.S. speaker. So you have uh, China trying to underscore that it, it will continue to impose costs on Taiwan and it will continue to make the case that there is there is uh, you know uh, absolutely no basis for Taiwan uh, to uh, remain independent and autonomous and I think that's the challenge that a lot of the countries uh, in and around Taiwan also face as to how do you ensure that Taiwan is supported because even within Taiwan we have seen differences emerging in the last few months uh, we have had a former Taiwanese president uh, visiting uh, China, mainland China, and this is quite unprecedented. Uh, this, is, this, this was the first visit by any uh, Taiwanese uh, leader, Taiwanese president, uh, who managed to visit China. And he uh, his statements were very reconciliatory. And of course, he represented uh, the opposition Kuomintang Party. And then DPP, of course, the ruling party, the ruling dispensation is Taiwan, in Taiwan remains fiercely pro-independence. But I think it also tells you the divide within Taiwan in terms of its own future vis-a-vis uh, -vis China vis-a-vis -vis mainland China. And I think that's why uh, for a lot of the countries uh, that have that, you know, that are supportive of Taiwan, this poses them in a bit of a conundrum as to how far can those countries go uh, in, in, in helping Taiwan, in ensuring that, that Taiwanese capabilities are built over a period of time. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, America's role becomes uh, even more crucial. And so I, I think from, chi from China's perspective, this is a time, this is a moment when, when, Ta when China perhaps is uh, laying down certain red lines. It is, it is making a case to the world that Taiwan itself is divided, that this drive for independence is merely uh, one uh, leader and one political party in Taiwan that represents it, that uh, there is no internal consensus uh, on, uh, on what kind of a relationship Taiwan wants to have with mainland China within within Taiwan. And finally, that if there are uh, you know, moments, uh, opportunities that Taiwanese leaders would exploit in trying to gain uh, friends and support from outside, then China uh, and Chinese forces would show uh, uh, to Taiwan, the concept that there are costs of doing that. So I think the Chinese are well working uh, at, uh, at a multi-pronged strategy, and that seems to be the message that is going out to both Taiwan's friends uh, as well as the, uh, you know uh, those who perhaps consider China as their adversary. That there are limits to what China would endure when it comes to interference in this matter. Uh, and but this is extremely dangerous. This is extremely provocative to have simulation exercises around Taiwan, repeated simulation exercises uh, around Taiwan, uh, because this not only raises the temperatures in the region, but it also ensures that uh, for a lot of the regional states uh, already facing a very very volatile global political and economic environment, another flashpoint emerges, which which keeps on uh, you know uh, burning off and on, and which keeps on keeping uh, all the countries in the neighborhood on tenterhooks. And that is something that I think all the regional states are worried about, that a spark uh, can be lit, which can bring major powers uh, into the Indo-Pacific, into Taiwan Straits, and which is going to cause a major conflagration. But, Ty uh, but China, of course, is, is uh, you know, not really interested in, in the wider consequences. It is merely interested in sending out a message to, to Taiwan, to Taiwanese people, as well as to those who support Taiwan, uh, that uh, there are certain red lines that uh, China would not allow uh, either Taiwan or Taiwanese supporters to cross. But well, China is sending out messages. This is a flashpoint. This entire region, the regional states are very, very worried. But as you say, probably China is just interested in sending out messages and not really going all the way for now, at least. But China is also when you talk about the multi pronged strategy that China is adopting China here, we see in Arunachal and Bhutan, again, a two pronged strategy, the pressure that's building up on Bhutan. I mean, recently when the Bhutan prime minister made a statement that China is a party to the Doklam tri-junction dispute. Um, but we also see that in the Chinese newspapers, 
uh, one one understand there's a lot of pressure on Bhutan to take this this stance. It's built, the pressure is building up on Thimphu. And here in Arunachal, China again uh, started what it has been doing earlier too, the changing of names. So the the catas you know the cartographic deception that it um, indulges in that's also going on um so it's raising the temperature here as well and it's a it will be also a setback or how will it affect india's relation with bhutan and you know in arunachal another flashpoint that is already there you know with india's relations with china of course uh, have hit the, the rock bottom and and uh, indian foreign minister has uh, said they are quite fragile. Indian military leadership has uh, talked about a degree of concern about the volatility along the border areas. So the relations are quite, uh, you know, uh, are at an inflection point. They are um, they are not really progressing in the direction that perhaps India would like. Uh, and China has given no indication that it is serious about India's concerns. And in fact, as you mentioned, uh, in almost uh, every case that we see being projected, China has taken a position that is increasingly uh, uh, in opposition to India's stand. So, uh, you know, there are, uh, you know, there, there is no possibility in the short to medium term of this improving anytime soon. And the two cases that you mentioned are very interesting because in one case, which is the, the, the case of Bhutan, where in fact the, the Bhutanese prime minister uh, was merely repeating what he had said in the past and what even in India has said in the past that, look, this is, of course, it's a tri-junction area. And so it would mean that all three parties will have to be privy to any kind of a conversation as to how this problem gets resolved eventually. Uh, but I think what, the, uh, what many in India would be interested in would be to look at how Bhutan, uh, Bhutan's negotiations with China progress. And they've been progressing uh, slowly but steadily. Because Bhutan has a tw twin problem uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, China, they have a they have a northern border problem and they have a western problem, which is which is where Doklam uh, fits in. But there is, but I think what Bhutan is hoping that because the the contestation between China and India is rising by the day, uh, perhaps uh, you know this is the moment when they should go ahead and and strike some kind of an arrangement with China on the northern frontier, which is their boundary dispute with China. And therefore, in that direction, the negotiations have been going on. And it, these are very delicate negotiations and very difficult negotiations because Bhutan, of course, uh, has a special relationship with India. It would like to keep India, uh, you know, in, in, it would like to keep India in the picture. So, so there are multiple, uh, you know, uh, factors that will play into how Bhutan resolves this dispute. But certainly many in India would be would be interested and in, and in, in, in be following it very closely as to what happens there, because it will have direct bearing on India's relationship with, with both Bhutan and China. But with Arunachal, I think what we have seen is certainly there is this repeated reference to the sinicization of the names, uh, the sense that this is the third time that they've done it. They have made it, uh, you know, and I think what they are doing is through this uh, which they do, uh, you know, cartographic deception, lawfare, whatever you might want to call it. Uh, they they create new facts on the ground. They new they create new realities on the ground, and they are hoping that when that when they would sit at the negotiating table, they would bring these up again, and therefore the negotiations will start not from the present day realities that exist where India is, uh, when Ar Arunachal is an integral part of India, but they will start from this. You know, from this premise where they have already changed these names where they will they will start asking these questions that look uh, you know this is a this is a new reality for you to, to contend with and this is where we need to start the negotiations with so basically putting india on the defensive uh, even on an issue where india uh, where arunachal remains an integral part of india and there is no uh, you know th there are no two views about it within india so i think what uh, and, and this is i think uh, the strategy that that chinese have mastered and Chinese uh, have tried to uh, position themselves uh, as uh, as that kind of a that th those kind of negotiators uh, who change the realities on the ground even as as they are negotiating an already disputed territory and I think this is what is happening in the case of Arunachal and this is I think going to be another of those friction points uh, as we move forward as we try to resolve Ladakh we will see that this is also this area also becomes very very volatile because at the moment uh, Chinese uh, look at this problem as one where India has stood up to China 
in Ladakh, where India, India has made it very clear to China that they cannot be pushed around and that they will defend their territory come what may. And therefore, I think for China, it is important to find other pressure points and they will continue to search for, this, for those pressure points along uh, a very, very long disputed border. Absolutely. So the big question is, how does India really take on this challenge? Uh, if, uh, China is repeatedly trying to uh, escalate the tension here in Arunachal too, while we are trying to solve other disputes. And amidst all this, we've heard that the Home Minister is about to visit Arunachal Pradesh uh, amid this whole border out. So it's a lot about China on this episode of the Ideas Factory, China's aggression in Taiwan, China's aggression here in Bhutan, India and European Union leaders looking up to China to solve uh, or probably bring an end to the Ukraine war and bring them out of that crisis. But that's all that we have time for on this episode of the Ideas Factory. Thank you so much, Harsh, for your analysis and joining us. And thank you to all of you for watching. Thank you. Mm -hmm.